So we have a roller coaster going around a vertical loop or any other object going in an upside down vertical loop for that matter. There's an infinite number of places that we can perform an analysis on. Okay, the object can be anywhere going around that circle, but there's two places, the two extremes that we will focus on. We'll focus on when the object is at the top of the circle and when the object is at the bottom of the circle. Now, I don't care whether this is a roller coaster on a track or whether it's my keys on the end of a string. It doesn't matter. Okay, it's going in a vertical circle. In both cases, whether it's the keys or whether it's the roller coaster, there's two forces acting always, whether you're at the top or the bottom of the circle. What's one of those forces? What's the easy force? Well, gravity. Gravity always acts which way? Downwards. Good. So whether we're at the top of the circle or the bottom of the circle, gravity will act downwards here. Whether you're dealing with the keys on the end of a string or whether you're dealing with the roller coaster on the track, again, it doesn't matter. What other force will act here, although the direction does change depending upon where you are? What other force do we get? Garrett? Good. The normal force. If this is a roller coaster track, the normal force is the force of the track pushing on the car, right? If this is a, a, a string you know, pulling my keys around in a vertical circle, the normal force would be the string, right? The force of tension in the string. Which way does the normal force act when you're at the top of the circle? Which way is the track pushing? Somebody said it, I think. Down, yeah. The track pushes down. Now, we don't know how big that normal force is compared to gravity. Oh, it depends on how fast the car is moving or how fast the keys are moving. When you're at the bottom of the circle, the normal force still acts. In fact, it's even more important when you're at the bottom of the circle. Which way does the normal force act when you're at the bottom of the circle, whether it's due to the track or whether it's due to uh, the string pulling on the keys? Which way does the normal force act? Yeah, right? Upwards. Good. Now, uh, this time we know the magnitude of the normal force compared to gravity. Which one's bigger, gravity or the normal force, when you're at the bottom of the circle? Devin, which one's bigger, normal force or gravity at the bottom of the circle? No. It would be the normal force. Think about that. No. Really, think about that. If gravity is bigger, then the net force is which way? Downwards, right? If the net force is downwards, you're not going to curve upwards in a circle. You have to have the upward force bigger than the downward force, right? Otherwise, you're not going to stay in a circle. All right. Well, in both cases, in both cases, we say the net force is equal to the sum of the forces, Fg plus Fn. Same as we did with every other problem back in Unit 2, our dynamics unit, when we had a free body diagram drawn. Now, in Unit 2, we also said the net force was m times a. Here, we change that around a little bit. F net is also equal to not MA, but rather M times, what am I going to put in right here? Yeah, V squared over R is equal to FG plus FN. And that's exactly the same thing whether you're at the top of the circle or at the bottom of the circle. MV squared over R is equal to FG plus FN. Now, we've got to worry about putting numbers in. And when we put numbers in, we have to worry about putting signs in as well, positive signs and negative signs. At the top of the circle, at the top of the circle, mv squared over r would be what? Positive or negative? Right? Negative y. Good. Look, if you've got two forces acting down, which way is the net force? Down. And of course it must be. It points toward the center of the circle. It's a centripetal force. So it's got to be pointing downward. Gravity is always going to be downward, so it's going to be negative. The normal force is going to be... Already have it, we already have it drawn downwards, so we're going to make that negative as well. mv squared over r, this, we'll wait on that one. That's a hard one, actually. Gravity is negative because it's down. The normal force is positive because it's acting up toward the center. Uh, the centripetal force, negative or positive here? It's positive. Good. Why? Yeah. Good. It's pointing towards the center of the circle. And if you're at the bottom, the center of the circle is up from you. Now, you can look at it a different way as well. Gravity is acting down. The normal force is acting up. Normal force is bigger. If the force acting up is bigger than the net force, the centripetal force will be bigger as well. Positive as well. Plug numbers in, solve. 
solve the two problems you had for homework, in fact. Page 264, number one and three. I know we've got to go over number three. A couple of people asked me when I was taking a look at that. Anybody for one? No? Just three? So it says a 0.98 kilogram rock is attached to a 0.4 meter rope and spun in a vertical circle. The tension of the rope when the rock is at the top of the swing is 79 newtons down. What's the speed of the rock? Draw it at the top of the circle. Here's the rock. At the top of the circle, just the same as it was in the review just a second ago, gravity acts down and the tension in the rope acts down as well. We'll call that the normal force. Or you could call it FT for the tension. Or you could call it FS or FR for string or rope. I'm going to call it FN, just to be consistent. F, F uh, net is equal to FG plus FN. What's F net also equal to? You know this, right, James? So what do I put in here for F net? M times? No. I think you might be thinking of something else. It's kind of a little chemistry like, actually. mv squared over r equals fg plus fn. All right, let's plug some numbers in here. We got a mass of 0.98. Um, we're looking for speed here. Uh, the radius here is 0 0.40 meters. 0 0.98 times g, 0 0.98 times 9.81, plus the normal force is uh, the tension in the rope, which is the normal force is 79.0 newtons. Now let's worry about our negatives and positives. Centripetal force, which way does it act when you're at the top of the circle? Somebody told me, I think it was Ryan that told me when we were reviewing. Which way does the normal force act? Downwards, yeah. So let's make that a negative value. We put numbers in there, let's put a sign in there. Gravity acts downward, let's make that a negative as well. And the normal force acts downward, we'll make that negative as well. So let's solve this now. Let's pull out the calculator to do this. The right hand side, we're going to say negative. Let's turn it on first. Negative 98 times 9.1. And let's subtract from that 79.0. Gives us on the right-hand side negative 1,040. Sorry, did I make a mistake? Yes, thank you. See, listen, guys, though, that's what I'm talking about when we're talking about being active, right? I didn't make that mistake on purpose. Okay, but it's interesting that you know a couple of people at the back caught that and said something, right, as opposed to just kind of sat there and just didn't even notice or just let it go. Okay? Be active. Thank you, guys. 0.98 times 9.81. Let's start over again. <laughs> 0 0.98. Can we do it right this time? Times 9.81. Let's subtract from that 79. Is that right? Negative 88. Does that look right? Neg 88.614 on the right-hand side. Now, how do we take the 0.4 over? It's on the bottom, so we get it over by multiplying. Times it by 0.4. Take the 0.98 over by dividing. And then we're going to square root that. What we do, we get 6.0. All right, that makes sense. I'll swing my keys around my head again vertically. Notice that these keys are going plenty fast in order to make it completely around the circle, right? What happens when I slow the keys down a little bit? Still going around the circle, right? What happens when I slow them down a little bit more? Slow them down to this point right here. The keys don't go in a circle anymore, right? 
So if I'm going fast enough, the keys go in a circle. When I'm going too slow, the keys don't go in a circle. They fall out of the circle, right? Agree? How do we find the minimum speed? You're on a roller coaster. How fast does the roller coaster car need to be in order to not fall out of the loop? If you're swinging a bucket of water over your head, how fast does it need to go in order to not leak out? So how slow does it need to be going in order for the water to be falling out or for the keys to fall down as I swing the water over my head or the keys over my head here? How slow does it need to go? Well, we're not going to demonstrate this with the water because I don't want you to see the water actually fall out on me. But the keys is something different, okay? Swing these around. Go a little bit slower, a little bit slower. What happens at the minimum speed? Well, the keys almost kind of fall out of the loop, right? They almost fall out of the circle. How hard is that string pulling when the keys are moving at the lowest possible speed? Look at the string. It's not pulling at all, right? When it's moving at the minimum possible speed, the string doesn't have to pull at all. If the object is going to fall out of the circle, this, the object has to be going too slow. But how slow does it need to be going? Well, the minimum possible speed that it needs to go in order to stay in the loop is going to correspond to when the string or when the track or when whatever it is that's providing the normal force isn't actually helping at all, when the normal force is zero. Again, watch these keys. Yeah, right now, clearly, the keys are going plenty fast to stay in a loop around the circle. You can see here that the string is pulling, right? The string is pulling pretty hard. If I slow it down, the string doesn't have to pull as hard. If I slow it down, the string isn't pulling as hard. If I slow it down to this point, and it's just barely staying in the circle, the string's not pulling at all. At the top of the circle, the only thing that contributes to the centripetal force at the top of the circle is gravity at that point. When you're going faster, the string has to help out gravity. But when you're going the minimum possible speed, gravity is the only thing that does it. So have a look at this question, okay? There's a 700 kilogram roller coaster. That's pretty heavy, right? Not as heavy as the one you're going to be on in uh, 18 days. It's full of people. It goes around a vertical loop that has a diameter of 50 meters. Now, that's a pretty big diameter. That's a pretty big roller coaster loop, 50 meters. Okay, the one that you're on at West Ed will be a smaller diameter, quite a bit smaller than that, which is good because the smaller the diameter, the more forces you feel, the more exciting it is. It bigger looks, oh, it looks scary, but not when you're on it. The bigger it is, it makes it easier when you're on it. The tighter the turn it is, the scarier it is when you're on it. What's the minimum speed that this roller coaster needs to have at the top of the loop to stay on the track so that it doesn't fall out? So it doesn't go around like this. What's the minimum speed that it needs to be going? Well, let's draw a free body diagram. We know that we're going to analyze the top because when it falls out, it's going to fall out at the top where the force of gravity acts down and the normal force acts down. The net force is equal to those two forces combined, Fg plus Fn. Mv squared over R is equal to Fg plus Fn. Now, at the top of the circle, the normal force is equal to zero if we're going the minimum possible speed. Now, if we're going above that, we have to include that. But at the minimum speed, the normal force is zero. So it becomes mv squared over r is equal to the force of gravity, which is m times g. Here's some good news. Because we've only got two terms now, and mass is in both of those terms, it cancels. What does that tell you when you're going around a loop on a roller coaster? The mass doesn't matter. So you can be in there by yourself. You, know, you can be a 130-pound young man or woman. Or you can be a 200-pound person sitting beside a 300-pound person and not have to worry in either case about falling out because it doesn't matter how heavy the... the uh, the car is, or how, ma how heavy the people inside the car are. Your roller coaster car is going to be something like 1,200 kilograms. It doesn't matter, because the mass is irrelevant. 
V squared over R. Let's solve for V. V over R, 50 meters. Uh, wait. R is what? Oh, almost messed up on that one. What is it, Kevin? Good. 25 meters. G is 9.81. Now, technically, at the top of the circle, both of these are negative because they're downward. Although, if you leave those off, it end up canceling anyways, right? Take the 25 up by multiplying. Say 9.81 times 25. Get us 245. Now, what do we do to get rid of the squared? Square root it. And we get 15.67 meters per second. So, you want to keep this roller coaster in the loop? Make sure that you design it so that it's going more than 15.7 meters per second. 16 is fine. 15 is going to make you fall off. This safety mechanism, just in the off chance that it is going a little bit too slow, it's kind of locked onto the track, so you don't really need to worry about falling off. It becomes a little bit scary. So, no, you can actually stop it. They can actually stop it upside down uh, on a loop. Um, they wouldn't do that, but, but it can be done. Um, and it wouldn't fall out. Um, the reality is if you're going too slow, what would probably happen is you just kind of go back. But that wouldn't happen either. I mean, something would really have to go wrong with the ride in order for that to happen. So, But there's that built-in safety, safety mechanism just in case. Okay, let's have a look at these two questions, please, that go along with that whole minimum speed thing. Remember, minimum speed, set Fn equal to zero. The questions you did for homework last night, Okay, you didn't set Fn equal to zero because you weren't finding min speed. The only time you set Fn equal to zero is when you're finding minimum speed. Got it? Okay, let's get at it. All right, everyone, we're going to shift gears a little bit here right now. We're still going to talk over the next week or so about circular motion, but it's going to be a very specific case of circular motion. That is, when the Earth or when other planets are revolving around some other object like the sun. So heavenly motion, the motion of heavenly objects, the motion of planets and moons and so on around stars and planets and so on. Let's go way back in time, a couple thousand years. In fact, about 2,500 years to Aristotle. You guys have heard of Aristotle before, right? Okay, Aristotle said a lot of things, including the Earth is the center of the universe. Even 500 years later, Ptolemy, the Earth is the center of the universe. Still, okay, 1,900 years ago, we still believe that the Earth is the center of the universe. The time of Christ. Okay, when Christ roamed the Earth, we thought that the Earth was the center of the universe, and all the other objects, including the Sun, revolved around the Earth. We call it the geocentric theory, the geocentric model of the universe. Geo means Earth, centric means centered, the Earth-centered model of the universe. I mean, that seems ridiculous to us now, but at the time, think about it. It doesn't seem so ridiculous. If you were around 2,500 years ago, how would you know that the Earth was not the center of the universe? How would you know when you look up in the sky and see the sun rising in the, in the east and setting in the west, and you see it throughout the day moving around the south, when you see the moon moving around, how would you know that the Earth wasn't the center of the universe? How do you know now that the Earth isn't the center of the universe? Because somebody told you that's how you know now. So although it seems so far-fetched, and it is, it is completely wrong. The idea that the Earth is the center of the universe isn't such a hard one to buy into if you haven't been told otherwise. Because when you look up, that's what it appears to be. Things seem to be revolving around the Earth. They just aren't. Well, if we're going back 2,000 years ago and talking about what people don't believe now, 
what we believed 2,000 years ago, but what we don't believe now, then we should fast forward a little bit and see where the model of the universe kind of came next. Let's fast forward about 1,500 years. Copernicus, you guys have probably heard of him as well, Copernicus. The heliocentric theory. The heliocentric theory says the sun is the center of our solar system. All the planets, including Earth, the moon, or sorry, including Earth, including Mars, including Jupiter, and so on, revolve around the sun. There was some resistance to this because it wasn't intuitive. You look up in the sky, and again, the sun appears to be revolving around the Earth. So there was a lot of resistance to this. But we know now that it's correct. The Earth is not the center of the universe. The Earth does revolve around the sun, as do the other planets revolve around the sun. Let's fast forward another 50 years. There's a couple of guys here. First guy is Tycho Bray. Tycho Bray, he's a, I like this guy. Uh, kind of an odd duck, but um, a couple of good stories about Tycho Bray. Uh, 50 years after the time of Copernicus, late 1500s, he's not just looking at the sun and the other planets and saying, okay, the Earth is, a, is not the center of the universe. The Earth and the other planets revolve around the sun. He's trying to explain it. Not just say this is what happens, but rather explain a little bit more about why it happens, how it happens. He didn't get all that far, though. He made some observations. He made some measurements of the motion of planets, including the Earth, the relative position of the sun, how long it took for this to happen, how long it took for that to happen. He didn't really have time to formulate some kind of idea from that data. He died a little bit of a premature death. A little bit of an odd duck, as I say. He had a metal nose. Like, literally, his nose was made out of metal. He got in an argument one time over a math question, literally, over a math question. And he settled it by getting in a sword fight. He said, listen, we're going to fight this out. Okay, whoever, whoever wins the sword fight, well, they're right. Well, he lost the sword fight. He got his nose cut off, literally. In a sword fight. So he walked around with a metal nose, with a nose literally made out of brass. Then he goes to a, a dinner party one night at a buddy's house, okay, and he's sitting around the table, and he's got to pee. You know what it's like, right? Like you, you drink a lot of water or a lot of Coke or whatever, and you got to pee lots. Okay? And then you get up and go pee. That's what people do, right? Well, he did because he thought it would be kind of rude to, to get up and go to the bathroom when he was at a dinner party. So he stayed there, and he held it, and he held it. He crossed his legs and did whatever he had to do to hold his pee. He got an infection, and he died something like nine days later. So he literally died from, he literally died because he held his pee, because he had to go to the bathroom, and he thought it would be embarrassing to go to the bathroom, so he held it in. Okay, don't hold it in. I don't want you to die. You're probably not going to die of a bladder infection now anyways. We have antibiotics now that we didn't have back in 1590 or whatever. Um, moral of the story is, don't get in a sword fight over a math question, and when you got to go to the bathroom, put up your hand and ask to go to the bathroom. Okay? So he made the naked eye observations of the planets with his assistant, Johann Kepler. Johann Kepler took that data and did something with it. He formulated three laws. We call them Kepler's three laws although they were based on, based on Bray's data. Kepler's three laws that talked about how the planets move, not, not why they move the way they do, or how they move the way they do, but just how they move. Okay, the motion of the planets beyond the planets go around the sun. So what are those three laws exactly? Well, the first law we call the law of the elliptical orbits. This diagram is a little bit odd because it's got two suns. The reality is, of course, there's only one sun. The sun is either at position one or it's at position two, not both. Okay, the sun is at position one or position two. The Earth and all other planets go around the sun in an elliptical path, not, not a circle. The Earth doesn't go around the sun in a circle. It goes around the sun in an ellipse, which is kind of a stretched out circle. There are two focal points of that ellipse. One of the focal points is at position one. One of the focal points is at position two. 
the sun must be at one of those focal points. Now, don't get confused here. It's not that the earth decides where to go and then the sun says, oh, I should be here or here. I should go, you know what, last time I was over here, this time I'm going to go over there. Okay, the sun is where it is. The sun is fixed. It's essentially where it is. The earth's rotation, or revolution, I should say, around the sun is based on where the sun is. Now, the sun has to be at one of the focal points, but it's like saying, Tyler stands up, and he stands right here. When I orbit around Tyler, I decide where to make my path so that Tyler is at one of my focal points. It's not that I go around in an ellipse and Tyler decides where to go based on where I'm going, right? Tyler's there. He's the sun. I walk around him such that he is at one of the focal points of that ellipse. It doesn't matter which one. Okay, focal point number one or focal point number two, the sun's going to be at one of those two focal points for the motion of every planet that goes around it. Does that make sense? So we'll say quite simply, the law of elliptical orbit says that the Earth and all other planets revolve around the sun in an elliptical path, although not nearly as elliptical as I have it drawn here. This is really exaggerated, just so that you can see that it's not a circle. It's much, much closer to a circle than it looks there. But it is an ellipse. It goes around in an elliptical path with the sun at one of the two focal points. The second law. This one looks really confusing. Just hold off on writing this down, okay? Just pay attention to what I'm saying here first. The law of equal areas. Here's the sun. We're assuming the sun is at position one now, okay? Here's the earth revolving around the sun. The earth is in, let's say, position A. Let's say a month later, two months later, it doesn't matter. A certain amount of time later, the Earth is at position B. So it's moved around like this from position A to position B. Make sense? Forget about the right-hand side of the diagram right now. Just focus on this. There's a line that joins the Earth to the Sun. In a certain time interval that we'll call delta T, it could be one month, two months, one day, six hours, six months. In a certain time interval that we call delta T, this line that joins the sun to the earth will sweep out a certain area. In other words, that shaded area we're going to call A1. It will sweep out that area. Now, let's fast forward another six months. The earth is over here in position C. If the time interval that it takes to go from position C to D is the same as the time interval that it takes her to go from A to B, then the area swept out by this line is going to be the same. In other words, if T1 equals T2, if the time interval that it takes the Earth to go from here to here is the same as the time interval that it takes to go from the Earth to go from the Earth to go from here to here, if those two times are the same, then A1 will equal A2. Those two areas will be the same. So what? What does that really have to do with anything? What kind of practical implications could possibly arise from this? Well, let me erase this to declutter it a little bit here. If T1 and T2 are equal time intervals, what do you know about the speed of the Earth as it goes around the Sun, or any other planet for that matter as it goes around the Sun? If those are equal time intervals, the speed's got to change, right? Because it's going a bigger distance from here to here than it is from here to here. A bigger distance in the same amount of time means it's going faster. It speeds up as it goes around the Sun, as it gets closer to the Sun. Okay, we'll pick this up tomorrow, okay?